everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Bible Discoveries, The Weekend Show. So on this program in the Ministry of Bible Discovery, we're going through the entire Bible this year. And on this show, we take our daily reading, our weekly reading from Monday to Sunday. And that's where we try to hang out in that zone. But we take your questions based off of that area of scripture. And we use it as a discussion starter here on the show. So if you have questions about this program, about what we're going to talk about, or for future programs that you want us to answer, pop them down in the comment section below or shoot us an email because we would love to hear from you. If this is your first time here, I'm Corey, and I'm joined by Matlock, my husband. Hey. What's going on? So many things. That's right. So, so many things. So many things. (laughs) So many things such as Psalm 139 to Proverbs 14. Mm-hmm. Right, and and if you're like Corey said, if you're reading with us, that's great. And if not, you should join us. So, Corey, we have some questions today, and for you guys that are pertain to the Psalms and Proverbs. Right, we're busting into Proverbs now, which is exactly. nice. Exactly, it's a welcome break after being so long in the Psalms. I love the Psalms. Don't get me wrong. Right, but I like to read a few Psalms, kind of sprinkled with my other daily reading. But yeah. when we're going through the Bible, we really chunk. You're so the liturgical. Psalms. Okay, so let's... Um, <laughs> True facts, yes. Okay, so let's uh, start. Let me ask you the first question. Sure. Okay, so Psalm 139. This is from Joshua. Okay. And, and he asks, Why is David so hateful and prejudiced in the Psalms? How can the Holy Spirit make him to say such hateful things? I thought God was love. Now, regarding 1 Psalm 39, I'm just going to say the verse. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming it's related to 21 to 22. So I'll read verse 21 to start. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So um, the the context of Psalm 139 is helpful to this because there's other areas, I think, in the Psalms where you could also accuse David of something like prejudice and Psalms. The one thing that, like, there's a couple things that we have to keep in mind when it comes to Uh, interpreting the Psalms and interpreting a person like David from this time period writing this, Uh, because we tend to take it from our own perspective, normal and natural, but we have to remember what David was going through. So David was, he was a king of warfare. The, this is actually, remember, why God told David that even though David wanted to build God a temple, that he was actually disqualified from building God a temple because he was a man of war. There was blood on, there was a lot of human blood on his hands. Uh, and <clears throat> um, so David being involved in a lot of warfare was a necessity for ancient Israel. Oh, I think I just lost my, I did. I lost my ear. I can feel it going in my hair. Just going to take it off. It's okay. It's fine. We're just yeah. going to, we're just going to take the other one off. That's right. Join it. Warfare, not earrings. Warfare today. <laughs> okay. So, uh, David being involved in life and death situations all the time, uh, this was necessary for Israel because he was securing the borders of Israel. He was pushing back the enemies of Israel out of Israelite territory. It's not nice, but it was a reality of David's time. And I think that we see that reflected in the Psalms and we see that reflected in Samuel as well, where um, you have to, to survive something like that, you have to get yourself into a different mindset that's not necessarily like nice. It's not sanitary. It's not Western in its way of thinking. So um, we should expect to see this reflected in David's writing. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that, where he's asking God to protect him from his enemies. He's asking God to, to resist those who are coming against Israel. He's asking God to stop the enemies of God. Because we have to remember as well, Israel wasn't just a political identity like it is today in the world. Israel was primarily a religious entity. It was called by God to be a nation from whom the Messiah would come. So Israel was playing a role in the redemptive history of the entire world, of mankind, not just of uh, Hebrews. Um, And so the enemies of Israel were also the spiritual enemies of God, Uh, not only physically, but also spiritually trying to bring in false worship and idol worship and stop the worship of the true God in this area of land. Okay, so 
Um, now let's talk more specifically about Psalm 139. Um, the hatred language is another thing that we have to talk about because when we talk about hatred in our Western society and love, we tend to think of it emotionally first. So I can hate someone while still treating them like a human being or still treating them with respect, like in our Western mind. In the ancient Near Eastern mind, that's not a thing. So hatred is, is rejecting someone and, and not prioritizing their needs at all. Whereas love, showing love, is showing them prior, priority and, um, and taking care of them and nurturing them and things of this nature. So when David says, I hate those who hate you, he is giving absolutely no priority whatsoever. He's completely rejecting, not necessarily emotionally, but it, it could involve emotions. I mean, especially when he said with a complete hatred, maybe it was for David, the enemies of God, people who had made themselves hate God. So they had, so what this did was as the leader of Israel, David is saying, I will not make unholy allegiances with people who hate you. Um, unfortunately, Solomon did not do this, David's son. And we see how that turned out because as the king of Israel, as the leader of Israel, it was David's responsibility and Solomon's responsibility to make wise relationships for Israel, political and otherwise. David did make alliances but he apparently made godly alliances as opposed to alliances with people who were enemies of God. So th I think personally that goes a long way in explaining the language of Psalm 139, where uh, he's, he, he identifies these people that he's hating, that he is refusing to show any sort of preferential treatment to or priority towards. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. O oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? So David is showing his complete loyalty and allegiance to God. Anyone who is your enemy, God, I have nothing to do with them. Even if physically they could provide me with more military protection, they could provide me with uh, economic advantages. They could provide me. So we have to look at this as David's role as king. But I do, I do think that it also has personal application for us even today right. when it comes to who are we letting have a voice into our lives? Who are we listening to? Are we making sure that that our Christian family is actually our family. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, I hear you saying. There's, there's nothing wrong with, well, I mean, we're commanded to evangelize. We're commanded to go out into the world and, um, and to love people. But we are in a different time and a different season than David, where we don't have, we're not building God's physical kingdom in the same way that King David was, he was literally building a physical Israel from which would come Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And Jesus Christ would then open this physical kingdom and make it a spiritual kingdom until the fulfillment when Christ returns again and it will be a physical kingdom once again. Okay. Well, what do you think? Well, besides getting to the eschatology of it all, I think there's a couple of things. I think you're right on par with saying what hate, hate actually means. I think that there's, a, there's um, um, a distinction between, first of all, people like to make love and hate opposites and they're just not opposites. Uh, Jesus says, if you don't hate your mother and father and follow me, you'll have no part in me. Yeah, it's so, a priority But he doesn't, he doesn't say not to love them or, or to honor them. Or treat them terribly. Or honor them. It's not You're, what right. he's saying. So, so, okay, so what, is, what is he actually saying there? So again, we have this like weird emotional way of looking at things where love and hate are exact opposites. Mm -hmm. But it's also a very um, weak view of love if you do think that they're opposites. Because you can technically, I hate saying this, but love someone and hate them at the same time. Um, because love is a deeper, more real, uh, I hate to call it a, just a feeling, but essentially it's just a, a part of you, like a bedrock of who you are, because God designed you fundamentally, God creates things to be good. So he created human beings to love each other. Um, so it's more fundamental than hatred is what I'm trying to say. So anyways, so love is more fundamental. 
And so with that in mind, um, hatred is just not an opposite. It, 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 it doesn't have the same uh, pull. So I, I don't think that they're opposites. So it's not like, how could it be so hateful? Um, say such hateful things. It's okay, well, it's not about, like you were saying, it's, it's more so about disowning and rejecting. It's not about that it can't be loving, right? As so you were saying, I thought God was love. It's not coming against that at all. And if David showed priorities, a priority, and 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 made allegiances with the enemies of God, right? He's giving validity to their behavior, which is leading to their death. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and 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 spiritual death because it's like essentially like these people. What is you already read it? Like they hate. They speak against you. God, and God is good, he's just, he's holy, he's all these things, with malicious intent. Mm -hmm. So they're coming against what's good, goodness itself, mm -hmm. love itself, and they hate love, and they hate goodness. They, like, they love death is the idea. So he's saying, these are my enemies. Fair enough. Yeah, okay. and that yeah. malicious intent is important too, because it's not like they're just saying this because they are they don't know what they're right. doing. They don't know what they're saying. They have a malicious intent. They're That's trying right. to do this. That's right. So the point is, is that... Um, he, yeah, you're right. He's dividing his allegiance up, being like, look, I, I'm for you. I'm for goodness. I stand for truth and love and all these things. Who the, the, the character, who you are, I stand for that. And then uh, he's staying away from people who are completely against that. Mm -hmm. um, so far be it from it being about, you know, hate and love being opposite things. He's saying, no, I, I love uh, love, essentially. I love God. I love goodness. I love those things that you, uh, that you of who you are. Um, so, and, and it's a prejudice it's like, no, if, you know, if you're prejudiced, like the most, let's say Satan, am I prejudiced against Satan? It's like, it's like, no, <laughs> like Satan's pure evil. It's, it's, it's kind of a silly thought to be like, are you prejudiced against really evil things? It's like the, I hope so. Yeah. It's like, was Aragorn <laughs> a prejudice against the orcs? It's like, well, I race? hope he was prejudiced against the orcs, <laughs> the right? The ring wraiths. Yeah, the ring wraiths. Yeah, it's like, uh, I, <laughs> how dare they destroy the one ring, the poor orcs. It's like, I don't know. Well, the, and also, like, David's not prejudging these people. He's describing their behavior yeah. and judging them based off of their actual behavior. Yeah, I know. Right? Yeah, so it's not unfounded either. I know. The whole thing, I just think it's um, a misunderstanding of what love is and a misunderstanding of what... Uh, prejudice is but yeah right. Right. and what, what david is, is saying yeah, exactly the, right. i think i think what's so awesome about david though is the last two verses of this after he goes through that whole thing he says in verse 23 and 24 search me O god and know my heart try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting so it's not as if david is elevating himself over these enemies. And I think this is such a cool part about David is right. that he always recognizes his ability to become the thing that he right. is standing against. Um, and, and we see him here asking God, like, show me. Right. I'll, I'll show me if there's right. these ways in myself and I'll change them. Now, regarding your, the eschatological uh, view that you espoused, which was, uh, it's about a, one one's a physical and one and the other one's spiritual. Just to clarify that, because some people might hear it that it went from completely visible to completely invisible. Oh, I see. And, yeah. and that's not what's happening. No. So um, it was a physical kingdom, right? That was always bound by the circumcision of your heart. Then what happens is the emphasis is then prioritized in the Christian faith. Like, no, it's about that first. So there's an emphasis there. But as Christianity grows and gets more and more people, right? As Revelation has, like every, like the, sand, the as many people as the stars and the sand of the seashore, it eventually becomes a it's a physical kingdom. So there's physical elements in the kingdom, visible elements of the kingdom. The kingdom is growing physically, like a mustard tree. Um, so it's not just like invisible. Yeah. And it's not just like in the ethereal realm to spiritually living. It's growing, but the fundamental prioritization is the change of heart and it's right yeah. so so that's what's really important there because inherently on earth as it is in heaven it's going to grow and have physical visible material offshoots which includes church buildings quote unquote temples or whatever you want to call it you see what i'm saying but it prioritizes with the temple of god the people first you have the temple of god the people and then there's a material uh culture that surrounds that but inherently the priority is the, right, the people and God over the material culture itself. Whereas in, if you look at 
as Corey's talking about, the material culture was heavily prioritized. Yeah, yes, which right. makes sense because there was a physical king and the physical, like genetic people. Right, Ark of the Covenant, and, temples. And, and a physical temple. But what did Christ say to Pilate when he asked him, are you a king then? Right. And Christ says, if my kingdom was of this world, right. my servants would take up swords yes. and fight. Yes. Right? And, and so right now, our king is in heaven. Right. And we don't have, we don't have like a Christian military. We don't have a Christian. It's not the same thing. We are not just Israel re-stamped now. Right. Like, but there will be a physical kingdom when Christ returns. You know, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth where everything is together. We're going to have a physical king. I guess it's going to be God and Christ himself, you know? Right. So that's what I meant. That's okay. What I meant. Okay. That's what you meant. Yeah. Okay. okay. So let's, let's move on. Let's then. move on. I want to ask you this question, Matlock. Psalm 145. Uh, what does the expression mean, bless his holy name? How can a sinful human bless God? Okay. So um, there are other verses in the Bible where people say, bless God. I'm going to list them out. Uh, Luke uh, chapter 1, verse 64. Chapter, Luke again, 2, 28. Luke 24, 52, 53. And James 3, 9. All of these say, bless God. Okay? People are like, well, how can you bless God? Um, I think this is a misunderstanding of what bless is. Because often we hear the word bless and we think material prosperity. Um, and that's not what that is. Obviously, you can't give God material prosperity. He owns everything. Um, bless simply means to speak good of. I, like I, I'm speaking good of God, like bless God, like like that's essential. So it's not about emphasizing whether or not you're giving God material value, which you know all of everything that you have. God's not gaining gaining anything by that. Is what I'm trying to say by you, by you right by your sacrifice. You're right. God is growing you is the idea. Um, but yeah, so you're simply just saying you're saying bless God because you're speaking good of Him. I think that's as simple as that. Right? We bless God. Um, it's like saying praise. We praise God. I, I just don't see an issue with that. I think that um, each words themselves have different emphases. Um, blessed is God, right? We say that so God is blessed. Um, again, another uh, variation of saying that God is inherently in himself blessed. Therefore, we say bless God. It's not something that we can do in ourselves. We're just, it's something we just attribute. So anyways, that's my really quick answer. No, definitely. If you look at if you look at Psalm 145, if you're trying to find the meaning of the word bless, we know that especially in the Psalms, there's a lot of um phrases that the author the authors will say one way and then they'll say the uh, a, a slightly different way. And so you can learn a lot about the meaning of a word just based on the other phrases that are around it. And so like verse two, every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. So bless and praise are together in verse two. If you skip down to verses 10 and 11, all your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord. All your saints shall bless you. So thanks and bless. They, they shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. So there's like this... Um, giving thanks, giving praise, blessing. It's all within that same giving God the glory that he's due, testifying about what he's done for you, testifying about who he is, that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I think that hits it. Corey, let's yes. move on. Okay, let's move the on. The next question. This is related to Psalm 146, 147, and 149. The question is, what is the significance of Zion for Christians? Right. Okay, so I could take this in a lot of different ways. Yes. But, okay, so if we go, so Zion is another name for Jerusalem in the scriptures. There's there's a couple other times where the prophets kind of swap out the name of Jerusalem for whatever they're trying to, uh, it, for different connotations that go along with their prophecies. But Zion is another name for Jerusalem. And in the scriptures, uh, old and new, Jerusalem is seen as the city of God. 
So it's like this place of, it's like as Babylon is seen as the city of chaos and the city where, um, city that perpetuates sin, right? So Babylon was a real place, but then it becomes this symbol for all that's wrong with humanity, right? For sin and, and all the things that sin entails. Whereas Zion becomes a place where God will emanate from and, and God will conquer from. Um, and so I think that's a really, really simple answer yeah. where Zion and Jerusalem become the city of God, whereas Babylon becomes the city of human sin and evil um, and satanic resistance against God and, and his okay, people. Okay, so to kind of a caveat here. Interesting that historically Babylon, it was like, people say it's like one of the first civilizations with like, quote unquote, human rights. A lot of people try to argue these things. Right. And religious plural, yeah. uh, pluralism. So it's, it, what's interesting about it is that if that's all true, and you know, God's calling the world Babylon, oh, like, vey. I think if there though. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'm so skeptical. That's interesting. It's interesting to think yeah. about. But um, okay, so Zion is just, a, what, so what else did you have in mind though? So. Well, okay, so I mean, you can't be living in the in in this decade and not know that it's a hot button a hot button term right now. Yeah. So you could go like you could go just into within Christianity when you're talking about okay, what's if if what's the significance of Jerusalem to the Christian or what's the right. significance of Zion to the Christian? Well, depending on your end time views or eschatological views. The significance changes a lot. Right. Because if you're of the branch that believes that Jesus Christ is returning physically to establish a millennial reign before the before the end, before the final judgment, before the new heavens and the new earth, you believe that he's coming to Jerusalem uh, because that's what the prophets talk about. Um, so there's there's eschatological or end time significance potentially to Zion mm. and Jerusalem. Now, politically and religiously, you could also talk about Zionism. Right, right, right. Right? Um, and the, you could talk about the support of Israel. You could talk about the, the, uh, the, the politics of the region that's going on there and all the anti-Zionism and anti-Zionist protests that are going on and um, right. all, all over the Western world right now. Right, right, right. So there's lots of ways that you could go with it, but I think boiling it back to... The symbolism within scripture, again, you've got the city of God versus the city of evil. Right. Yeah. Well, interesting. Yeah. We could talk about that. We could. <laughs> maybe if there's enough time, we will, but maybe not. We might Corey, circle back. We might circle it could back. be a whole show in and of itself. Oh, I know it. We it should get be. like, we should get a couple different Christians of different stripes to come on maybe. Yeah. And talk about, that would be, in, I like that idea. Do yeah. you like that idea? Let me know. I don't want it to become like, an argument, but like an actual interesting oh. conversation might be nice. Yeah. I don't know. It depends. I think boys would like arguments. But <laughs> that's well, me. I would, I would prefer, brawl. I would prefer a In profitable, fact, like there's yeah. nothing wrong with disagreeing. And, and I, that's good. That's healthy. But if you're just like yelling I think, at know, each other, it's not very helpful. Or, or you could just Unless you've got aggression chase. to get off. <laughs> cut, cut to the chase. Just put boxing gloves on. We'll go to the ring. <laughs> this will be the ring. <laughs> this right and here. Wh whoever no. wins the fight wins the <laughs> argument. That, that's kind of where I'm going. I, I prefer to fight with my words, though, if we're going to fight. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I'm a lady. That's fine. Yeah, lady that's fair enough. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's maybe we on. should move on. I think, sure. I think we digress far too much. Yeah. Far too much. Okay, Matlock, I'm going to ask you this one. Sure. Uh, from Proverbs 1, we're moving into the wisdom literature, which is always exciting. Matlock, how can the fear of the Lord be the beginning of wisdom if perfect love casts out fear? All right. You know what? Riddle me this. Riddle, riddle, riddle. Let's go to 1 John 4, verse 18. Why well, I went way too far. Okay. So here it is. 1 John 4, uh, 4, 4, 4, 18. <laughs> Making up new uh, numbers? Let's start at verse 17 because it kind of helps. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is so, also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. 
For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Okay. So, long story short here, here, perfect love casts out fear because fear has to do with punishment, right? So, the fear of the Lord um, is not just fear of punishment, but it entails that. It has to entail that. Um, but there's something here that's really interesting. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, right, and they wanted to be made wise, they took a bite of the fruit, right? They wanted to be wise like God. And what's the first thing that happened? They became very afraid, okay? Because they had, they had, they actually got wisdom uh, of knowledge of good and evil, and they realized they did very wrong, right? That's the idea. Um, so there's actually a fear factor that's involved in this that's actually very healthy. Uh, you have fear of specifically moral understanding, justice, um, deserved punishment, right? Rewards, punishment, rewards, and just mercy. You have a better under, you have a better sense of moral understanding. So when you have fear of the Lord as the beginning of wisdom, you essentially have a moral understanding that if you do something wrong, then bad things, right? Then you deserve punishment, right? And that, like the Proverbs, because it's Proverbs, before you act, that fear comes before you act. So you have that knowledge of it. What John's talking about is perfect love casts out fear. It's like you don't have the fear. You don't, or you're not actually afraid in the present tense because there's no punishment. You're not... Because you're loved by God, because he first loved you, and because you're a Christian, you're not under subject, subjugation or punishment, if that makes sense. Um, subjugation for punishment. So the point of me saying that is, uh, Paul, uh, John's talking about it in like the present tense, like if you have fear, if you're actually afraid, versus Proverbs about before you act, like this fear. Now, the fear is actually very helpful. And it's funny that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the most popular one. If I'm just going to go to Proverbs here for a second, because uh, it's not... The only one, the, actually the most famous one, everyone thinks that the, the beginning of fear is the beginning of, sorry, to fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, is the first one, but it's not. So I'm going to read you all the fear of the Lord stuff, okay? To kind of emphasize this point. So there's uh, four, four, five times, five times the fear of the Lord is mentioned in Proverbs, okay? So the first one is uh, chapter 1, verse 7, where it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Next, it's uh, 8.13. And this is the one I think that is key here for this discussion, but I'm going to read it for you in order anyways. The fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil, pride and arrogance, and the way of evil, and perverted speech I hate. Then we go again to 9.10, uh, and it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's the most famous one. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Okay, so that knowledge, when you think about what knowledge here, you think about you know, what Adam and Eve knew. It's like intimate knowledge. Then 1427, um, it says, The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life. The one may turn away from the snares of death. So it's like the fountain of life. Why? Because if you actually fear God, you're going to avoid his punishment. Right? And there, thus be saved. Thus repent when needs to. And the last one is 1533. And it says, the fear of the Lord is instruction in wisdom, and humility comes before honor. Okay, so all these are contrasting, being like, you know, uh, it's wisdom, it's knowledge, and it's instruction, the ability to apply that wisdom in a practical setting, right? And to instruct it and like a, be able to teach it and apply it, both verbally and with your deeds and word and deed. Uh, but the one I want to highlight specifically here is the fear of the Lord, is uh, chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is the hatred of evil, pride and arrogance in the way of evil, and perverted speech I hate. So that is lining up with this idea that the fear of the Lord is that moral understanding. That's what that is. You understand what's going to happen to those who do evil and those who do good. You understand what that means. So you have a moral understanding about you. And therefore, right, it casts out any fear that you could have. Um, uh, uh, Basically, preemptively, if you're in God's, if you're in the right, essentially. So these, this isn't a contradiction. It's again, there's there's two different tenses there that are happening in both John and with Solomon, and um, yeah, that, that's my long-winded answer. Okay. Yeah. Great. Is that it? I I think so. I think you explained right. it well. Okay. Corey. Yes. This is the last question. Oh. And it's 
only half an hour in. Well, maybe we can always circle back around. Oh, we'll have to circle back around. Okay, give ready? like a taste test on Zionism. And stuff. This is a, <laughs> yes. All right, so let's read this. Okay, so this is a general inquiry yeah. from Bobby Morris. Okay. Hello, I've been wondering what Bible do the Bible stuff we read on your show every day. I am wanting to purchase a new Bible soon. I now read the New American Standard uh, Bible, updated NASB edition. And I noticed that when you read on your show, the words are sometimes different than mine. And I don't always have all the contents in different parts compared to the Bible I and my husband received in 1975 when we were married, the NAB, uh, the Catholic Educational Guide, which sometimes I go to read what I don't have in my American Standard. Thank you so much for any help you can give me. Yes, I am Catholic, but I'm born again Christian who all my life, even when I was very young, has always asked questions people couldn't answer. And I always talked to God and knew he was always there and he would answer my questions and he does. Thank you for all you do. Amen. That's right. awesome. Thank you, Bobby, for, for your... Um your testimony and your question. Um, so on the Bible Discovery Show, we use the New King James Version, so the NKJV. At first, it was because, so the show's about 30, uh, about 30 years old. And at first, I think it was a copyright thing that we went with the NKJV, but yeah. now now we just keep using it because why why change a good thing right now, you know? Yeah. It's a nice translation to read from. Uh, when you get into the Psalms, it's really poetic, but NASB is a great one. But yeah, if you want if you want to be word for word identical to what is read on the show, it would be the New King James Version. Yes. There has been some talk, like I presented this, like should we change, I, pre I presented this to your dad specifically. Should we change the translation every year just to kind of spice things up? Right. And your dad was like, no way, kind of thing. Like, <laughs> right. uh, it would cause pandemonium. It'd be chaos. Chaos. And I was like, you know, I think it'd be valuable uh, just because, you know, the ESV, the NIV, and um, the New King James Version, even the King James, like, they all say it in such a different way. But it's actually valuable when you read the different translations. It definitely is valuable. And that's, and, and I can kind of, blow the lid off behind the scenes too, is that I know like all the cast, which is my dad, my mom, me, and my brother, I know that we all read multiple versions right. of the English Bible. That's right. So I, I know we're all using those and cross-referencing those. So it's just on the show, we needed to have like a standard one that we always use for the gra for the graphics and, and things of that nature so that we're all kind of... Um, on the same page when it comes to that. Yeah. So yeah, we use we use that version on the show, but I know in our personal studies, we're all using different versions. What are you using right and now? And we all have different, we all have different um, ones that we like. The one that I have right now is the ESV. Right. It's not my favorite. I like it, yeah. but it's not my favorite um, for no reason. Like, yeah, there's I, no good reason. Yeah. There, I, There is literally no good reason. This is not my favorite. I think it's just because it's different than what Right. I've used and what has impacted me in the past. Um, I've read all sorts of versions. The first uh, Bible that I ever read when I was 10, 11, and 12 was the New Living. Right. And then I switched to the NIV. And then I read the New King James. And then I think I moved to the NASB. Now you read the Greek. And no, I, I wish I read that. What a flex that would be if yeah. I just had like a Greek. No, no, I do not no. read the Greek. Uh, but yeah, I had never read uh, through the ESV, but Matlock and I help at the youth group at our church. And that was the agreed upon translation that we were going to use to teach through the gospel of John right. with the kids. So I had to get an ESV and I don't mind it. I don't mind it at all. Right. It's good. Yeah, no, I, the ESV is good. Uh, I actually like New King James version. And I, like I actually like them all for different reasons. Yeah. I don't have one that's like I like I like more than the other because I think some do a better job at yeah. translating at different areas. It just depends. Yeah. Like I said in this past, like I use ESV like right now. This is actually Rod's Bible, but I use that at home. And for when I do a lot of my work, our website uses the ESV, not the New King James. Oh, does so, it? Yes. There we so, go. So um, uh, but besides that, um. Yeah, like the, the, the way it describes faith is, is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen, okay? That verse in the ESV is like the confidence of things hoped for and the conviction yeah. of things unseen. Yeah. And I'm like, I just don't think that that's right. It's not that like they, they're usually good at being like literally this is what this is. But in this case, it's like it's the word substance. Like, like why are we translating it to yeah. confidence? Um, 
So I think the new uh, the new King James Version does a better job there. But then in other areas, like Deuteronomy 32, I think the ESV does a great job. That's why I, it really is so helpful to be able to, to go back, back and back. forth. If you have, even, even if you just have two different translations, but you can do it online as well. Yes. Like there are a lot of different Bible softwares and just online Bibles too that you can go back and forth they, between a few different translations. And it's always interesting to see the different English words that are, are used for the same Greek yes. words. And... Um, I know there's also Bibles that have, I used to have a Bible that, that had um, four different translations at once yep. with four different columns. Yep. Because um, it is helpful sometimes to read, like, let's say the NLT, a plain reading, Definitely. a very plain reading, or the NIV, so plain, written in our modern, right, modern tongue. Uh, but then, you know, it's good to also read, like, okay, what's it literally translating as? Because, mm -hmm. for instance, when it says uh, offspring, sometimes that word's actually seed. If you're looking for something, if, it depends what you're doing. If you're doing like a theological deep dive, sometimes the exact word, not sometimes, normally, usually, the exact translation of the word is very helpful for a theological deep dive. Um, but yeah, yeah, so it, it helps. The problem is that like the exact translation of a word. I know. Is no, but but when it's used elsewhere, there's like no, a range. The point of, is yes. to harmonize it with elsewhere. It's used elsewhere in the text. Yeah. Sometimes <clears throat> you might have the same word that's. Uh, harmonize differently. So yeah. then you have to go to the Greek. It's a whole other thing. But anyways, that's my two cents on that. All right, guys. Well, let me know what you think in the comment section below. Send us questions or comments for future programs. We'd love to read them on there. And until next week, happy reading and studying.